He's on? Very good. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Wow, look at this. Uh, my name is Charlie Rathbun with Fort Culture. Uh, I told Elizabeth, I said, there's no way you can organize a forum in one month. You can't do it. You need committees, and you need strategic planning, and nobody's going to come. Um, anyway, thank you, Elizabeth. This is quite the turnout. This is amazing. Um, I, I want to, uh, well, this is what happens when we occasionally stick our head up out of the sand and uh, say, hey, uh, is anybody interested in accessibility for audiences with disabilities? And boom, uh, it just took off. Um, I want to acknowledge a couple people. One is Luis Mendoza, who's standing over here on the side, who came to us uh, well over a year ago. He's with the Washington uh, State Fathers Network in Kindering in Bellevue. And he approached us and a couple of our partner funders to find out how we could better organize the opportunities that exist and create more opportunities for access for populations with all sorts of disabilities and including uh, cognitive intellectual disabilities and things like that. And he got us meeting with Arts Fund and with the City Arts Office. And we have been meeting for well over a year with uh, service providers, uh, with folks that uh, serve the providers, look for these opportunities and trying to find ways that we can actually do, take all of the opportunities that are out there and figure out a way to make them just more available and accessible. And one, uh, and he's been a tremendous motivator, a great facilitator for us to keep us on point on a pretty sprawling issue. Um, and one other person I would also like to acknowledge is Daniela Federico. If I got that right, Danielle, where are you? Here. <laughs> 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 Danielle has been exactly. Sensory access. Uh, we are currently working with Daniela on uh, creating a new website, actually augmenting a wonderful website that she already has, to uh, make it a lot stronger, a lot more robust, add in a lot of resources, a lot of training, and yes, you guessed it, even a calendar, uh, and uh, helping to promote that uh, regional, regionally wide throughout King County. And uh, so we now have some resources lining up here that are going to help us actually accomplish a very important part of what we're trying to do, which is make uh, the art accessible to everyone, both for audiences, for artists, for administrators. Uh, so we're just getting started on this, and uh, we're very excited. And I want to uh, thank Elizabeth again for getting this going and organizing it. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Shea, who is my uh, cohort at the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so I was going to specifically introduce Daniela with sensory access because my main talking point was be sure to get her card before you leave because of that whole online resource that we're talking about that we're going to be in partnership with. Um, we want to get you connected with that service and how you can get more resources on how to do this work um, and make your arts and cultural offerings more accessible um, to people with disabilities across all spectrums. Um, in my office, I also want to uh, acknowledge part of our consortium is also Arts Fund. They could not be here today, but they have been a part of this year-long process of conversation and dialogue where we've been meeting with social service providers, self-advocates, um, and also um, people in the arts and cultural community such as yourselves. Thank you all for being here and thank you to Elizabeth for putting today's on. There will be more workshops coming throughout the year that we're also sponsoring. Um, so we look forward to being in contact with you for all of those as well. Thanks. Now I'm gonna introduce Jeffrey Herman of the Seattle Repertory Theater for making this space available. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm Jeff Herman, I'm the Managing Director here at The Rep. I'm really excited to have you all here um, and have this workshop here <laughs> in uh, The Poncho. Um, the space that you're sitting in um, was recently renovated. We just uh, sort of opened it up in December, so you're among the first um, folks to be in here. Um, these are brand new seating section, um, new AV, nice new wall treatments. Um, we've also added uh, hearing loop technology uh, in the floor here in the space. Um, so I'm really excited to, to have you all here. Um, 
Uh, this work in access is something we've been trying to take very seriously here at the Rep. So in addition to the hearing loop in this space, um, we've added it in all of the uh, public locations of our building. Um, we, uh, we've got the uh, wheelchair accessible door to the front entry. There's a lot more for us to do. Um, I think like all of you, we're, we're trying to, to make progress in this area. And I'm really excited about having this opportunity this afternoon to learn more about it um, so we can all make progress as a, as a community together. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you see the Wi-Fi uh, network and password is up there on the screen. Um, bathrooms are out of that door, um, uh, straight out that way, and then uh, just off to the right. Um, and uh, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, the woman without whom none of this would have been possible, uh, Elizabeth Ralston, who's a force of nature, if you haven't gotten to meet her yet. Um, she, uh, Elizabeth has a public health and not-for-profit background. Her work involves uh, building capacity within organizations to enable them to communicate their mission and impact in an inspiring way to engage volunteers, donors, community partners, and program participants. Um, Elizabeth has served as a consultant in not-for-profit organizations working on uh, program development, fundraising and communications, event planning, and board development. She's been in several interim leadership positions. In fact, she was recently interim operations manager for Spectrum Dance Theater. Um, she's passionate about the arts and grew up through lots of theater shows and museums. Even though she has hearing loss, she does not let that stop her from enjoying all that the arts have to offer. Um, I really appreciate all the work you've done to pull this all together. We're really happy to have you here and to be hosting this. Um, and without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth Ralston. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Jack. Um, welcome, everybody. Let me see a show of hands. Who's from museums? Who's here from museums? Way up high, way up high. Okay, great. How about theaters? Awesome, great. And how about other cultural spaces? Fabulous, fabulous. So welcome. Thank you for taking the time out of your very busy day to come and spend the afternoon with us, learning all about access and being with these wonderful people who also are spending the time with us to share their experiences about what it's like for them accessing the arts. So I want to give really a bit of a background as to how this all got started. Um, but first, I really have to say thank you to our sponsors, because without our sponsors, this would not be possible. And um, that goes to um, for culture, arts and um, topics of arts and culture, and of course the Seattle Web for making this possible. And it's been a great ride, and I know there's many people along the way who made this possible as well. Lots of volunteers and lots of community people who've given me feedback on what's needed and what's missing. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about how I got started um, down this path. Um, as Jeff said, I'm a huge lover of the arts, especially the theater. Um, I grew up with a brother who uh, took every major role he could get in the theater in high school. And I would help him memorize his lines. And so I got to know all the different songs from Rogers and Hammerstein and Gabriel and Sullivan, you name it. And so um, I was also introduced to the theater in London. When my parents moved to London, we um, went a lot to theater and to museums. My mom was a docent in the um, art museum, so she was huge fan of the arts. So they never let my hearing loss stop me from doing whatever they wanted to do. They just brought me along. So I was um, uh, eternally grateful for that opportunity. Um, so when I moved to Seattle, I, um, I brought my love of movies here too and realized that none of the theaters uh, had captioning. And this was over 20 years ago. And so I got a bunch of friends together and said, hey, let's Captain Seattle. And we call our group Captain Seattle. And the first theater we worked with was Cinerama. And Cinerama now has captions on um, other movies. And ever since then, it's kind of spread to other movie theaters around Seattle and beyond. Um, and my first, you all know my first theater <coughs> captain experience was with the Titanic. And that was in LA, and that was that movie blew me away because it was the first time ever that I had been in the theater with captains, and it was it was an amazing movie to see. 
So that uh, I started thinking about um, equity and access because I'm a public health junkie and I um, have been with nonprofits for many years. And I started thinking about, well, I love going to show that I can go wherever I want. I have to plan on my life around one show, or one of the show, or um, whatever you know, kind of entertainment there is. So what can we do to make um, the arts more equitable to people with disabilities? So um, I started um, talking with people in the community. I've met a lot of you, there's some new faces here. And I started talking and seeing what missing, what the gaps were, and what was needed. Um, and so I also met someone um, in Chicago who was heading up the Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. And I uh, learned a lot about their effort and realized there were many different efforts around the US. And Seattle didn't have one that I knew of. And so in my research, I started finding out about little pockets of efforts that were happening, um, such as Daniela and Lewis's effort. Um, and got really excited about the um, opportunity of making this a larger effort, one that encompasses all people with disabilities. So, that said, the goals of uh, the mission of the consortium, uh, the Seattle Penn County Accessibility Consortium, is to ensure that Seattle Penn County's vibrant arts and culture arena is accessible to people with disabilities. Um, and so the goal of this consortium, as I see it, are um, to provide professional development and training, like the workshop, for example, because many people in the arts, um, we're working with limited budgets and understaffing and that, a whole host of other issues. And um, it's hard to think about accessibility when you affect the time. So why not have a clearinghouse of information where anyone could call up or go and get some training to learn more about how to make the organization more accessible to people with disabilities. Um, I'm also envisioning a website um, which would have an access calendar, a listing of all the accessible spaces, a listing of the workshops and training and resources. And by the way, I'm going to, I'm happy to send this PowerPoint to, and to you, so you don't feel like you have to write notes, but just relax and so on the computer experience, or so, so good the experience. Um, and finally, equipment sharing. At some point, it would be great to have um, a repository of equipment because theaters, different theaters have different budgets. Some can afford more equipment than others. Why not have an equipment sharing program where small black box theaters, for example, could fall from this um, repository and allow more diversity in their audiences? Um, so, the consortium, I would like to see a steering committee, and this steering committee will be made of people who are passionate about the arts, and passionate about access, and passionate about seeing people of all disabilities access the arts. And so, the role of that steering committee will be to guide the vision and the strategic planning of the consortium, to create these kinds of workshops. You know, we can't do it by ourselves. We need help doing this kind of thing. But the connection between the arts and disability communities, with membership and participation, so spreading the word, uh, because there's so many art organizations, not just in Seattle, but beyond, in King County as well, and advocate for universal access at cultural facilities. So, um, if we need you. So if you're interested, um, please contact me, feel free to email me, um, we can have a conversation about what that would look like, time commitment. It's a volunteer opportunity, and hopefully your organization will support that kind of opportunity. So, today's workshop, I know you're dying to hear from our parents, so I'm going um, as fast as I can so that you can hear from these, what these people have to say. But today, I hope to have cultural administrators like yourself have a better understanding of people with disabilities live experiences accessing the arts. And secondly, um, get insights on how to engage people with disabilities in the arts. I've heard from many of you that um, 
it's hard to sometimes meet people with disabilities and find out more about what their needs are and what, um, what they hope to experience in the arts. So this is an opportunity to do, do just that. Guidelines for this. I want to make sure that you know that this is a safe space. Uh, we respect all efforts to work on accessibility issues in your organization. Um, the fact that you are here is a big deal. We recognize that each organization is at varying levels of accomplishment with accessibility. We're here to help you and not judge. Questions. It's going to be an interesting format. You will have the opportunity to text questions to the number up on the screen. Or you can write an index card. And Lewis up here has copies of the index card. And if you want one, just raise your hand and drag them down. At any point, this is an informal discussion, so please feel free to ask questions um, on no cards or texting. Um, you can direct the question to a particular panelist or um, to everyone, please indicate. And due to time constraints, we have a lot to cover. Please focus your questions on the lived experiences of our panelists, rather than general questions on hard solutions. So, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and get started um, with our questions. What we're going to do is um, go through some questions and maybe go back and forth with some audience questions, depending on what we get. Um, so the first question for all of you is, are you ready? <laughs> You're ready. All right. So the first question is, um, no, no, I'm, I'm doing it. So please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. What are your hobbies? What, are, what is something surprising that people might not know about you? And I'm going to have Mason do, read the bio of this person. Christiana Obsomner has been an intersectional disability justice advocate for over 15 years and carries his passion into the work as a consultant and community educator, organizer. They are the owner and principals of Euphanies of Equal Equity Education Consulting and co-chair for the Seattle Disabilities Commission and Renters Commission and founding ED of the Eleanor Elizabeth Institute of Black Empowerment. They are autistic with intersecting cognitive, chronic, and psychiatric disabilities. in artistic justice as a way to express my experience of living with uh, developmental cognitive and psychiatric disabilities. And it all came to a head when, in the beginning of the consulting business, I was a social impact consultant for the Seattle Opera and helped with um, inclusion of, um, of, in general, but especially for black folks. I guess some hobbies is I, I am an avid reader. I have an actual library in my house um, to the point that my friends ask me for books if I have them, and I often do. I like to watch a lot of uh, news and WWE on the television, and I, and I don't. <coughs> um, and I guess a surprising fact about me is that I have I have done two things that I have not yet found someone else while I've been in Seattle for the last 10 years have done. I've won a national beauty pageant. Um, I was Mrs. American Beauty's National 2016. Um, and I have experienced every type of natural disaster that there is to experience, except for a tsunami and a sinkhole. So if you need to know, if you need some emergency management tips, I, I, have, I am kind of a doomsday prepper. I can give you tips. Camille Jasney has been dealing with various eye diseases, including uveitis, glaucoma, and coronary problems since the age of five, and lost her remaining sight in 2009. She started a low vision support group and an audio book club at the downtown library. Camille also is an 
Outreach Co-Chair for the UW Eye Institute, and a spokesperson for Guide Dogs for the Blind, and is involved in the Art Beyond Sight program, which provides free monthly tours for the blind and low vision communities at the Seattle Art Museum. Additionally, she is a tactile artist who creates paintings, collages, and unique flowers out of buttons and copper wire. So, what a privilege to be here today. Thank you all for coming today. Um, about me, I have my guide dog, Egan, here. So, it's not a surprise to anybody. You probably walked in and saw him here. He's four years old, and he just, he just got back from a cruise in the Caribbean, where he was the star. Everybody knew who he was, and nobody knew who he was. <laughs> so, he, and he did a really good job. He likes to hike and swim in the water when we get to a place where he can go play. Um, I have a wonderful family, really supportive. My dad and mom always said when I was growing up with lots of visual problems and spending a lot of time in the doctor's office, I'm not handicapped, I'm handy capable. And my shoulders are broad, that's why I can handle whatever happens to me. And all these little sayings that I actually keep on saying to my children, which say, Mom, it's enough already. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I'd rather be positive than negative. And I love... Um, to be, I love music, I love theater, and I love art. And all my life I've, I've attended different various activities, but I, um, and, and I just find it to be so rewarding that there's actually places there to go to for people that are blind and low vision. Um, for me, people worry that I don't have a life. I have like almost too much going on. As my son said this morning, who's almost gonna have a baby any day with his wife, Mom, you gotta retire. You're gonna be a grandma. <laughs> so, but I also um, want something new, something that I've done that you might not know. I'm, I'm a collage artist, and I made eight pictures for the Accessibility Awards at Microsoft last year. And that was a really big honor for me to be able to do. And I just got accepted for another program. It's called Sixth Sense in Chicago for people that are blind and low vision to create art. And they chose my one picture for the poster more than the other one for me to be able to send and sell. And I'm, we're going to go to Chicago, my husband and I, to celebrate this experience. Abby Lang, a deaf artist, is the executive director of Deaf Spotlight, which oversees artistic and cultural programming to support deaf artists in their work. Throughout her career, Patty has pursued opportunities that encourage the deaf community to embrace and celebrate the arts. She has a BFA in ceramics from the University of Washington and an MA in nonprofit management for the arts from New York University. She believes that everyone has the ability to create and express their story through the arts. Thank you. Let's see, people don't know that in my family I have two other siblings that are also deaf. So the three of us are quite lucky to have each other because we were able to have communication access. Our parents took sign classes and they actually practically signed with us. So I'm, I'm pretty fortunate and I want to recognize that. Also, what I like to do is some hobbies. I love to travel. I like to meet lots of new people and learn different sign languages from other countries. Every country does have their own. Um, and also food and culture, history. Also, I'm, of course, I'm really lucky to live here in Seattle, so there's a really beautiful city and nature balance here. Um, I am looking forward to this panel, with these panels to discuss accessibility issues with you all. Laura A. Constable is currently a board member at both the Reed Foundation and Seattle Children's Theater. She was the first female president of Power 10 New York and an, organizing devoted, an organization devoted to raising money for the U.S. rowing teams and was on the governing board of the Yale University Art Gallery. Laura was trip specialist for back roads and ran Travel and Leisure's magazines as one of the world's top travel operators. She holds a BA in Art History from Yale University and an MBA in Marketing from Columbia University and a post-baccalaureate certificate from NYU School of Philanthropy. Laura was diagnosed with primary Progressive Multiple Sclerosis in 2009. Hi, everybody. It's great to see some familiar faces, so I really do appreciate some familiar faces. Uh, as the new kid on the block here with this amazing panelist, um, I'm better known right now as, as a, a professional chauffeur for my 10-year-old. 
to uh, school and this game and that game. Um, but I'm also passionate about the arts. Uh, my first job out of college was Jenny Holzer's personal assistant and um, artist assistant. And she represented the United States in the Venice Biennale. So first business trip was a month long, all expenses paid trip to Venice, which is not such a bad thing. Um, and now as things change and uh, we age gracefully or age in our own different ways, um, different challenges have uh, been presented in my life. Um, but I don't see them necessarily as challenges. And so, especially with my friends on the Children's Center board, uh, I'm hopefully gonna try and show everybody that these tools that, that, we, that we may use uh, to, for, for movement and for living aren't necessarily bar barriers or restrictions. They just really can allow everybody to live and move in different ways. And uh, let's see, another little known fact. I love the sun, so hopefully spring will come to Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> no, no more snow days. <laughs> So, that question, what does accessibility in the arts mean to you? What does it look like or feel like? So let's start with Camille, you have to start. <laughs> well for me, accessibility means being able to go to either a theater or go to an art museum and, and, and e either with the um, theater have audio descriptive so I can know what's going on on stage. I love to go to theater. I don't love going with my husband where we whisper back and forth what's going on. It's just so, and I've been asked, we've been asked to be quiet. So I think the whole thing for me would be um, being like sitting there like everybody else enjoying the, what they're seeing. I'm hearing it with, and it makes, I can understand it. Um, the museum, I love going to the museum. Um, for me, again, I just got recently an iPhone and some of the, the um, displays there, some of the current or maybe different pieces have some audio description to it. <coughs> to me, just being included in what everybody else is doing is what I would love. I would like to be part of what everybody with sites could do. Ah, let's see. Accessibility for me uh, would be do the, everything that, well, and just as an aside, just because I'm sitting here, you may not see, I, I have lost a lot of the weakness on my left side of my body, so I use a cane, uh, and sometimes an electric sweater. So in terms of what I would love for equal access is, um, I don't want to have any barriers. I would like to do the same thing as everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, separate entrances, in my mind, bring back images and, and policies of the Jim Crow era. Um, separate, it, sometimes you have to go around the side of the alley. Uh, Seattle's a little bit better than many cities. I grew up in New York City. Um, separate entrances are, are very common there for scooters and things. And uh, so I'd like to see those gone. Um, I'd love to outlaw revolving doors. Those are <laughs> particularly legal. Um, and I've had some choice words for people over the years for those. Uh, and I'd love to have the same amount of choice for seating options. Um, uh, I'd, I'd love to be able to take a scooter all the way up to the top of that, that uh, this, the chair, the stadium seating, as opposed to always just be assumed that it's close is the best and easiest. Um, I know when the last time everybody did go to Cinerama, I went, went recently went there for a movie and sort of an aha moment. I think Cinerama's gonna be my new favorite only movie theater in town because you can walk in and, and sit pretty much anywhere you'd like uh, with rooms and safely. I, ultimately, it's about fear for me. I don't wanna fall, I don't wanna hurt somebody else and hopefully if, if safe places are safer and more accessible, uh, the fear element can be removed. Some of these questions that I prepared are a little theoretical, so bear with me, but uh, I just really want to like lay out the answer to this question around accessibility. So when I talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we talk about inclusivity, I always use the, um, the Up to My Ride as a metaphor. Um, if any of you have seen that show, it's about an exhibit going and, and taking people and jumping cars, 
and then fixing them up and sweeping them up. And so I always say diversity is, is the outside, it's the paint job, it's the rims, it's, it's the chrome, it's everything that you see on the outside. It's when you have all of your photos or your website photos of a whole bunch of black people, right? And then in, inclusion is when you have, you try to get like a small sedan and expand it out so you can have 20 people in the hot tub. And so with inclusion, you are just trying to get as many people in as much as possible. But those people don't necessarily have the will nor do they actually have access to the engine. In Pit My Ride, the engines were, and things like the transmissions were actually never, um, or very rarely fixed. They just souped them up so they couldn't drive them. So if you try to have as much as inclusion as possible, that's great, but if they can't get access to actually drive the car or have access to have any input into where that car goes, then the inclusion actually doesn't matter. It's equity that matters. That I'm pretty sure it's gonna be the next question and I'll talk more about that. Can you speak, um, Christiana, can you speak from your experience, what it looks like for you personally when you go to some arts event? Yeah, I mean, I think that, especially coming from the disabilities that I have, there's, is there certain inclusions that people try to have, like lighting, um, perhaps. Um, you know, I think I am coming from things a little differently in that the diagnoses that I have are usually not what people think about with disability inclusion, which is a whole other issue that I think people need to remember, that the ADA goes beyond sensory and physical disability. Um, as for inclusion, to be completely honest, the reason why I share it in the way that I do is because very rarely do I see inclusive factors for folks with developmental cognitive and psychiatric disabilities. Um, I, when I'm a consultant, I see a lot of people who say, well, let's make sure that we have wheelchair ramps, which is important. Let's make that we have braille on the elevator buttons, which is extremely important. But how, how many times do you hear someone say, let's check for ambient noise? Let's make sure that we have soundproof walls for folks who, um, who have internal stimuli. Let's make sure that there's not too much overhead fluorescent lighting. Um, I can't give a example of a place that was fully inclusive, especially being an intersectional meeting and what it means for me to have developmental cognitive and psychiatric disabilities and to live them as such out loud um, with the rest of the identities I hold, like my race and my gender. Thank you. Okay. So the deaf community is a linguistic and cultural minority. So that means all of the majority is hearing people and so they talk and they focus on one's ability to hear or speak while the deaf community doesn't have access to that information. So of course they use their eyes and they sign with each other. So as for myself, for access going into a museum, I can't see the things around, right? I am a sighted person, I can read that, but I didn't realize that if you do have a QR code or something on your phone, you can get an audio description, getting the story about the artwork. I don't have access to that extra information. Sometimes I do ask them if they do have a transcript of that information, but then it's a lot of information to go through, reading both the information about the artist itself, the piece, and then the backstory. And as far as access to films, yeah, so, so of course, I like to be independent, and then if I can watch some films as I go through an art exhibit, um, and theater accessibility with that, there are lots of cool, uh, more and more shows, they are providing sign language interpreters there, they stand there on the stage, so I can watch the plays as well as the, the interpreters, but again, it's not 100% access to that art, because I want to see deaf actors on the stage within the plays themselves, not through a third person, through the interpreter. <coughs> I would like to see deaf actors, do their direct sign translation, their expression about a deaf vantage character, their stories, not a translation through a hearing interpreter. And also, often, accessibility to me means, uh, I, I would actually like to see other people like me in that space that I can interact with. Direct. Yeah, so, if there are some networking opportunities. And as far as theater, right, so there are some actors there. Maybe if I could also meet some admin or some staff who know sign language in the theaters, so that I can have a more direct connection with them. Um, also, I really just don't want any language barriers, so. I'd like to add a little bit about my own experience. Um, 
So Patty and I are both that, but Patty relies on um, ASL, it's a primary means of communication, and I rely on lip reading and speaking. And so not, the point I would like to make is not everybody has the same kind of needs. So um, someone who is blind may have a different need than someone who is low vision, for example. And someone um, who signs has a different need than someone who doesn't sign. So it's really important to meet the person where they're at and get to know that person and not make assumptions. Um, so for me, accessibility um, may not be the same thing that it is for Patty. For example, I rely on captioning. Um, I don't sign myself, so signing um, I wouldn't be able to understand. I also like hearing loops um, because I wear a cochlear implant. Um, and so I really appreciate the hearing loops because it really helps me hear the verses much better, so I don't have to completely rely on captioning. Um, and I wanted to point out also that we have several different um, accessibility um, methods that we're using in this room. We have interpreting right here, um, we have uh, captioning here, um, we have, um, we have uh, accessible ramps to get into the space, um, and we have a loop in this space, thank you Bob. We have a loop in this space. Um, is anybody using an assistive listening device? Yeah, so um, we have assistive listening devices here, if you did not know. Um, so there's many different m ways of making um, this space accessible. Um, for me though, I, I really like sitting near the front of the stage so that I can lift you. Um, as well as seeing the captains. Because if I'm too far away, then I have to look at the captains. And I really like seeing the whole um, verbal and non-verbal expression of the actor. So it's important for me to be able to sit up close. But often that prohibitive in terms of cough. Um, so when I was growing up, I would use scripts. And I would use um, a pen flashlight to follow along. And I would get a lot of comments from people around me, even the ushers, who would say, please put that away, it's bothering the patrons, which may or may not have been true. Um, but because these people didn't have uh, the understanding or awareness of what my needs were, it was often difficult. But now that captioning is here, I rarely have to use the script anymore. Any other um, additions before we move on? I would just say that yeah, while it's important to understand that there are very uh, different needs amongst a lot of these communities, there are some that are usable for everybody. Like the ramp, the ramp is great for mm -hmm. um, Camille and the dog, and it's good for walkers and wheelchairs. It's, it's good for moms and strollers, and, and um, so just when people start thinking about cost or complaining, oh, this would be expensive. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of these things that are quote unquote ADA compliant or ADA necessary or potentially perceived as only for a narrow subset of uh, patrons, um, I would argue that that's not necessarily the case. But these tools can be useful for many more. I would like to remind people, um, look at the screen, you can text questions anytime um, or ask Lewis for an index card if you have a question. So raise your hand and he will come and um, give you a um, card. All right, next question. So we could probably spend all day on this question, so I'm going to do my best to keep it um, concise as possible. What does equity in the arts relating to disability, race, sexual orientation, even class mean to you? Particularly in the arts, equity in the arts. Let's start with Penn. Let's see, I'm just thinking that's quite a big topic. I think right now, the word intersectionality is really hot right now because we are noticing a person and they're layering with themselves and their cultural identities. It's not really just one thing like, oh, here's, here's just one type of person. 
there's their path and their journey to consider and how they got to their current point. So for myself, I'm an Asian deaf woman. Okay, I I'm also an academic. And so my, my life experience is different than anyone else I've ever met. Nobody has my experience. Um, so when I consider how to make something equitable, right? I think an equitable working space or some type of performance or event space, I think they should hire different levels of folks, not just artists, but also staff and admin, and also funders as well grant sponsors, etc. So it's not just the talent that they look at, right? It's, you know, they need to look at smaller companies, maybe nonprofits or other organizations, or even if it is just a small group that isn't nonprofit, right? Just allow them to grow their work, grow their brand, and to represent their different views that exist. So I guess that's, that's it in, in a nutshell. So there's two ways of looking at equity, and, and for me, equity is, and I'm happy to go after what Patty has said because it's, it's very much the same. Um, equity is not going to be equity until I see people who look like myself in the organization. And <coughs> you talk a lot of, and there's two different ways you can look at it. With equity versus equality, I would say equality is when your organization matches the demographics of your surrounding community exactly. Equity is when your organization exceeds the demographics of your surrounding community, exactly. If you also want to look at it the other way, I'm also a nerd and academic, if you haven't heard those two, so it's good that we're sitting next to each other. But the social theory of critical mass, or the percentage of people you need of a specific identity to change the culture of an organization, is 26%. So let's just, let's just work on like disabled black folks. Raise your hand if your organization has 26% of your organization has disabled black folks in it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So. Yeah, no one just raised their hand. Yeah. So um, equity along the lines of how I come in as a patron is going to be impossible if there's not people who look like me at every step of the way. That is helping your organization drive that change and that innovation forward. So people who look like me or people who look like all of us really need to be in your ticketing office. They need to be who is curating your art or who is in your, um, who's, who's doing your casting. You need to have people who look like us who are your stage directors, who are backstage, who is your in your staff, who's in your executive leadership, who's in your board of directors. You you need these people to be there because you can't you you cannot speak on behalf of us. One of the biggest phrases that you hear in disability justice is nothing about us without us. So I so in order for this for me to even speak on how I can be um, experience equity in your organization as a patron, I would first want to ask you as a patron, what are you doing to represent equity in your organization? I will in no way be as eloquent as Christiana or Patty, so I'm not even going to try. The two things I would like to highlight though is um, the notion of proximity. Um, I think that if the most important thing in my mind is, is having somebody at the table to help make a decision or, or just make a design. Um, it's hard to, if you assume you make an ass out of you and me, period. <laughs> um, so if, you, if you're trying to um, make changes without knowing the first hand from a patron or a staff member with an issue, I, I, it's, it's just short-sighted and it may come back to haunt you. Or you may have to do any rework at going forward. Um, and the only other thing I would point out is that the disabled population, specifically in Washington State, is growing by leaps and bounds every year. Um, the latest figure I looked at, um, right now 13% of Washington State residents are disabled in some, in some way, and 40% of people over 65 are disabled. So um, from the business standpoint, there's a lot of money being left on the table. Uh, if, if you cannot accommodate uh, a, a broad, the broadest range of patrons. So my comment will be about people who are unable to afford to go to events, because I think that's really challenging. That just eliminates 
a big population. I think there's many organizations that actually have a, for a free day, a free, a, free, a free time for people to go to the museums or what have you. But it, it would be wonderful to, to create more of an open door situation for people, um, people with disabilities, but who can't afford to go to these events. Um, somehow uh, charge less, somehow be able to accommodate their needs. I mean, it's a really exciting feeling when you're somewhere and you're amongst people who possibly may never get to go to a museum, and yet they, this once a month, they get the opportunity to go in and feel the experience that everybody else does. So um, my goal would be to see more people have accessible entrances as far as getting into events like theater and museum, so that they don't they don't feel like they're they're isolated. It's it's terrible to be left out of what activities there are because of price. A lot of these events are really prohibited, so it's hard for them to afford it. No, I'd like to. Uh, yeah, I actually would like to add something. You know, if you do have some events, you can try to ad advertise people, but then what happens if they don't come? Yeah. Right? And it's because you're not reaching the right people with your advertising. You don't know who to reach out to. So all your efforts are kind of wasted, right? So who are you actually including within your service? Some people don't have the opportunity to work, even, or experience even just applying for that specific opportunity because they might have a skill or the opportunity without the professional development for them. So we, so, so we also need to have these mm -hmm. workshops, some formal teaching, et cetera, that's just not historically been accessible to people with disabilities. So you have to consider that as well. And also they might not feel welcome to any other type of event, just based on how they were treated before. So again, you really have to think about what's happening on the other side of the fence. Thank you. I wanted to add that, um, this is cut the booms up, um, you know, um, the sentiment that um, when you talk about equity and equality, how, what is the difference between that? And I want to show you this um, slide that I found was very interesting. Um, you can assume that everybody can get the right, the same kind of access, they'll be able to go in and enjoy the experience. So I'm going to describe this for Camille so that she knows what's up there. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so equality versus equity. So the first half of the image under equality, you have three people um, who are trying to see a game and there's a fence in front of them. And um, our three people have a box that they can stand up on to peer over the fence. And two people have a box that they can use to peer up over the fence. But the third person is in a wheelchair and has been given a box. But obviously, um, that's an equal way of treating people. You give them all the same thing, but does it work for everybody? No, obviously it's not going to work for the wheelchair, person in the wheelchair. And the other half of the image is equity. So you have three people who have been given three different types of things to ensure that they can see the game. The first person is tall enough, they can see over the fence. The second person is standing on two boxes, she can see over the fence. And the third person who's in the wheelchair is using a ramp to get up to see over the fence. So basically, um, you can give um, that you can give people uh, access, but you may have to adjust for the kind of access that that person needs, and that's what equity is all about. Um, and making assumptions, as someone said earlier, can be detrimental to the progress of a teaching. For example, um, oftentimes when I go to 